There's going to be a by-election in Sault Ste. Marie on June 1st because our next guest decided that 13 years of commuting from the Sioux to Queen's Park was enough. Former Cabinet Minister David Orizetti has now resurfaced as the Dean of Aviation, Trades and Technology, Natural Environment and Business at Sioux College and he joins us now to look back at his life in politics, his future in the post-secondary world, and yes, a by-election in his hometown. Nice to have you back in that chair. Great to be here, Steve. I want to start with something that um, I hear a lot from Mr. and Mrs. Everyday Ontario, which is they think politics is a waste of time. And I want to know whether after 13 years at Queen's Park, you thought it was worth it. Well, uh, I thought it was a great experience, and I hope that the community that I represented, uh, my home community, and riding a Sault Ste. Marie, uh, thought it was as well. I, I certainly, there's evidence of uh, significant progress in a number of areas. Tell me, start. Uh, healthcare, new hospital, state-of-the-art facility, radiation therapy that was non-existent in Sault Ste. Marie. In other words, individuals that needed cancer uh, radiation treatment uh, needed to travel, and uh, for those services, they don't. Uh, new infrastructure at our college, at our university, um, funding for a new OPP forensic lab, a, a youth center uh, where facilities for local youth were closed and shipped to Sudbury. Uh, there were so many investments that uh, our government made and uh, I was very involved with those and in working with a great many people in our community uh, in the various sectors and various organizations. Well, that's the thing I want to pick can't up say on. Enough about. It's okay. been a very I positive experience. I want to pick up on that because, you know, most politicians are too m modest to say, I did this. Without me being there, that wouldn't have happened. But I am inviting well, you to say that. Can you say that? You made that difference in getting those services I, there? You know, there's, there's a couple of schools of thought on this, as you know. I mean, you know, that an idea that an, an individual in opposition uh, may not have the ability to influence the same kind of change. I think obviously opposition members can be very influential in the work that they do. Uh, but being in government uh, gives you a bit of uh, an added benefit that um, you have the ability to influence perhaps uh, the outcome of uh, certain things in your community uh, more so. Uh, and you only were ever in government. You never were on opposition. Correct. Correct. I feel very fortunate lucky. to have been in government for yeah. the the entire time that I that I was at Queen's Park. Uh, some people are going to interpret your departure as an indication of a lack. Of, I mean, any time a current MPP steps aside, people are going to say, "Aha! Uh -huh, see, rats jumping off the Titanic before it has a chance to sink." Right. You want to confirm or deny? I uh, what I will say is the decision that I made was uh, purely about uh, my family. We have uh, two children in Sault Ste. Marie. Uh, my wife works in the education sector. Uh, and after 13 years, I wanted to be able to uh, spend more time with them. Uh, going back and forth has been has been a has been a challenge, uh, and also you know timing uh, the timing with respect to opportunities in the community to come back to making well, a transition in and out of politics is uh, is not always. Uh, is not always an easy thing, and uh, you know that from the experiences that you've had talking to other uh, former members. So the fact that there was an opening for a dean's position at Sioux College was, was influential it? in the decision? Absolutely. Okay, so tell us about the new job. What are you doing now? Well, uh, the aviation program is a remarkable program at Sioux College. It's uh, one of the most prominent programs right across the country, quite frankly. Uh, we have exciting programs in trades and technology, business, natural environment. Um, you know, the, the uh, opportunity to work again with students and faculty in an education sector and setting uh, was appealing to me. And, and what have they having, told you your mission is? Well, my mission, in terms of looking at programs where we could expand, where we could grow uh, new programs uh, at the college, uh, you know, reevaluating existing programs, what might be changed. We're launching an exciting new robotics uh, graduate certificate this fall. Um, the uh, a number of areas around aviation, for example, uh, drones and uh, training in uh, training in unmanned aircraft is a is a growing area and growing uh, field in technology. So, you know, my responsibilities are uh, throughout these areas, but I have great people to work with, the chairs of various uh, departments, um, and our president, uh, Dr. Ron Commons, uh, been a remarkable individual for okay. the last decade you, at the school. You know, we love the Sioux here. We take our program to Sioux Saint Marie every now and then. Our executive Absolutely. producer of this program, Stacey Dunseith, is from the Sioux. But we also know uh, the reality of, of daily life in Northern Ontario. Right. It can be a lot tougher than in the South here. 
post-secondary institutions have a tough time occasionally trying to attract students. Are you finding that at Sioux College? You know, uh, I would say that all northern institutions, and I would say that some in southern Ontario as well, are starting to, as of more recent years, uh, be challenged with enrollment. Certainly in the north we are. Um, and, you know, I have advocated for a number of years in government for a greater utilization of the existing infrastructure that exists in the post-secondary education sector. And whether that be uh, travel grants or residency grants or looking at the northern institutions and saying, on the net family income of up to 50000 where we now have free tuition for college and university, maybe in the northern schools we'll allow that to be up to 100000 for anyone living anywhere in Ontario to go to those schools because it's not helpful to have infrastructure in the province that's underutilized mm -hmm. while we look at building more capacity in areas on you know some of the most expensive real estate well, one in of the, the country. It, it, it's, not a, it's not a funny joke, but one of the jokes you hear often is that never, you know, never mind nickel and never mind trees, the biggest export from Northern Ontario is people, and the population has been declining. Right. Uh, do you think there's anything that can be done about that? Well, I do. I do. And I think government needs to take a leadership role in incenting behavior and creating opportunities. It's very different from saying you're going to suggest where someone should live. That's their choice, obviously. And we have many newcomers to Ontario. But the behavior of government in terms of the resources that it allocates and the leadership role that it plays can very much influence the health and well-being of our post-secondary institutions. As I mentioned, things like a travel grant or a residency voucher or net family income up to 100000 for individuals studying in the North, we would fill that capacity in the North and it would take pressure off taxpayers to build additional capacity in, in other areas. But presumably so, when you were at the cabinet table, you made all those arguments <clears throat> and the Liberal government, for better or for worse, I guess you would argue for worse, opted not to do those things. Why not? I think there is consideration being given to those things at present. I think the issue is becoming more prevalent and more of a challenge. And as you know, all governments uh, consider the, their financial uh, means and ability to pay for these types of things, it's important to utilize existing infrastructure. Uh, it's a demographic in the north as well that, as you mentioned, is in decline. Uh, and it would help to... I look at the example of building the Northern Medical School in Sudbury and with the campus in Thunder Bay. Mm -hmm. It really helped to turn uh, things around when it came to the physician shortage. I mean, it was a game changer when it came to physician shortages in Northern Ontario. Yeah, the idea is if you're trained in the North, you'll stay in the North. Absolutely. And that's been the case. Absolutely. And so that example, I believe, holds true in other institutions across the North. And, and, uh, and government needs to take a look at that more seriously going forward. I'm inferring from that that the current Liberal government hasn't taken it seriously enough. I think, I think there's more that can be done, and I would agree that uh, not enough has been done to create stability. There is, there is uh, additional capacity. We have classes that uh, could be filled. Many are, I have to say, our aviation program has remarkable enrollment. We have a natural environment program where I believe about 85% of the enrollment is from southern Ontario hmm. in the natural environment program. Our nursing program is certainly at capacity. But there are other programs in the school, and I know that you know if other individuals from other post-secondary institutions in the north were sitting here, they would, they would say similar things about their enrollment. Can I raise this with you, though? There, is, uh, there are very few people I've talked to in northern Ontario who don't feel as if they're being screwed over by decision makers in the south, particularly at Queen's Park. And now that you've, you obviously, you, you run municipal council in the Sioux before you became a provincial politician, so I, I guess you've got experience at this at, at two levels and can hopefully fill in some blanks here on this. What is it about Northern politicians who some people think, once they get elected and go south to Queen's Park, lose touch with their northernness, if I can put it that way? I, you know, I don't know if I find that to be the case. I, you know, the colleagues that I worked with uh, still, you know, hold very true to the values in which, you know, for which they were elected. Um, opposition or not, um, Northern Ontario to them is first and foremost in their minds, the communities that they represent. Yeah, Obviously in a government structure and a party system, you know, there uh, there's give and take and there are mm -hmm. uh, competing priorities. And part of it, I think, is that the, the voice in Northern Ontario, the electoral, you know, system and the ridings, just because of the demographics of the province, is changing. And the voice is weakening in some ways. If you look back uh, decades, uh, Northerners had a larger 
in larger say at Queen's Park. And so that is... Uh, I don't know how true know. that is. Can I, can I go through well, some numbers I, with you here? I, I let think... Me, let me go through some numbers. Where I'll are put we these adding the 13 here. new ridings? Okay, well, hang on. We'll go to that in a second. But let's put... The, Sheldon, bring this up okay. if you would, because I hear this all the time, that they're underrepresented in the North as compared to down south. Well, you're going to look at the individual... Sure. Well, here's what I'm going to do. Here's the... I mean, look right. at the graphic right here. Northern Ontario, there's the population, three-quarters of a million right. people. Four cabinet ministers for three-quarters of a million people. That's a ratio of one minister for every almost 200,000 people. Whereas if you look at the capital city in Toronto, right. two and a half million population, yes, admittedly more ministers, but actually fewer ministers per capita. Right. The North, technically speaking, is overrepresented at the cabinet table, although I dare say you'd have a hard time convincing anybody that that was the case. I don't, but the numbers show it's true. Well, I think if you look at... I think if you look at the broader GTA and you look at the number of members, not just in Toronto, mm -hmm. but if you look at Southern Ontario or GTHA, I think you'll find there's, there would be some additional folks that you could probably include in some of those numbers. The other thing is, I certainly wouldn't say that our current Premier has not made Northern Ontario a priority in the sense of that representation. I think you know, that representation has been has been good. But you'll and admit, when the federal government... You, the the yeah. province and the feds have the right. same riding boundaries. The feds have nine seats in the north. Right. The province has 11. Right. The province has kept additional representation for northern Ontario Absolutely. to acknowledge it has special needs that are not met otherwise. Right. But it continues proportionally to be eroded as the population grows much, much faster in, in southern Ontario. So over time, we'll continue to see, even though on an individual riding basis or mm -hmm. the the measurement that we use in terms of calculating the the aggregates for uh, population in terms of uh, the the uh, formula, um, you know, have have been favorable for what uh, what is the existing population of Northern Ontario. Mm -hmm. Over time, it continues to decline as but, newer seats okay. are. Okay, let me added. get back and to my original point. Though. Being added in the GTA. Okay, let me get back to my original point, sure. though, David, which which is I hear this all the time. We elect them in the north to represent our views to the south and instead what ends up happening is they represent the views at Queen's Park to us in the north. There's that disconnect. Right. Is that accurate? You know, as I said, I mean in a party system it's very different having served time on city council. If everybody wanted to vote a certain way, you could in good conscience. So you got to be uh, a team player. Well, you know, there is there is uh, that element to uh, provincial and federal politics that is different from a municipal level. But you know, I can tell you I came to Queen's Park with, with an objective, which was to do the best that I could for my community. And, uh, you know, you never forget where you come from. You never forget who sent you, and you never forget what they sent you to do. And if that happens, you're going to have a hard time at home explaining that to your residents, uh, you know, why, you, why they should continue to put their faith in you to represent them. And so they sent you there I, four times, didn't they? I would say, I would say that... You know, the, the folks that I worked with in Northern Ontario, in government and in opposition, are very passionate about the region that they represent and the communities that they represent. And there's a lot of similarities. I mean, our Northern Caucus uh, met regularly, and, you know, if you were listening to the challenges in Thunder Bay or Timmins or Sudbury or Sault Ste. Marie, you would find that there are so many similarities and so many common themes that... Um, well, what about this idea of John Vantoff, the... Um from northeastern Ontario, the NDP member, who'd like to see a not just a, a government caucus of northern members, but a legislative committee made up exclusively of northerners who could, across party lines, talk to each other and maybe share some ideas. What do you think of that idea? Uh, you know, fundamentally, I don't think any particular party has a monopoly on good ideas. So, you know, to the extent that it would help to benefit the region and benefit uh, the citizens of northern Ontario, I, I think there's, there's merit in that. You're I think okay John with that. is, uh, you know fundamentally trying to get at, you know, what are uh, representation issues for the for his constituents. Tell me this, you know you have heard increasing, I don't know how serious it is, but you do hear it out there. A lot of people in Northern Ontario, on, uh, Northern Ontario think they'd do better if they were their own province. What do you think? You know, we've heard that for years. Decades. I, there was a book written about that, mm -hmm. um, province of Northern Ontario, and uh, I think it was written by somebody who was originally from Southern Ontario, moved to Northern <laughs> Ontario, and uh, and didn't feel that they were getting the representation they needed. I, you know, I think I think we're stronger as one province, and I would not, you know, espouse that philosophy. Although, um, you know, not paying attention to and not uh, being mindful of the issues that are unique and do challenge Northern Ontario, 
um, does continue to fan those flames. If people feel like they're being, um, you know, ignored, then uh, then those types of conversations, those websites, that conversation around, you know, forming a separate government and being an independent province, um, uh, you know, continues to uh, continues to mount. But I, you know, and, I, and that's why I think it's so important that the province uh, be mindful of those challenges. And in many ways, the solutions to some of the things that are being faced in the GTA, when I continue to hear about high housing costs, uh, which, which has been you know, a problem for, for some time now and continues to, to uh, seize many people with uh, this issue, uh, as well as the transit and gridlock, uh, those issues. You know, you have 15,000 provincial government jobs south of Bloor Street. You look at a previous Liberal government years ago under the Northern Ontario Relocation Program that moved thousands of jobs to Northern Ontario. David Peterson to help did support, that. To help support, absolutely. And He moved you know, thousands of jobs to the Ontario, uh, Ontario Lottery and Gaming Commission, as it was then called, right. to Sault Ste. Marie. Do you think the uh, Kathleen Wynne government has allowed that to erode? Well, I don't know that... Uh, no, I wouldn't say that, that the government has allowed it to erode. The, in fact, it was... Uh, Ron Barbaro and the former Conservative government that allowed that to erode by allowing the CEO to leave and other uh, senior management to leave. But that's never been remedied. And that's really the challenge. And in fact, the Don Drummond report that uh, our government commissioned actually mentioned that uh, particular issue and, you know, advocated for one particular head office or organizational uh, location. And so that's something that absolutely could be Repatriated. I mean, that was a long-standing commitment to the community. You know what? That'd be something that, if um, there were a by-election coming up, maybe a local candidate would want to be able to announce. Absolutely. I haven't heard it yet. Absolutely. I haven't absolutely. heard it yet. I think that's something that is uh, worthy of conversation. <laughs> there you go. That's that's about as far as you're going to go. Are, on that, but eh? those are the opportunities that mm -hmm. exist in the north, and I think you know many areas and many communities outside the GTA that have infrastructure capacity, transit capacity, post-secondary capacity, uh, should be more greatly utilized. Uh, there's a lot of pressure on the GTHA uh, with uh, many, many newcomers here. And I think government can lead by incenting behavior and helping to support uh, uh, you know, more effective settlement in the province of Ontario okay. for newcomers. In, David, in our remaining moments here, I want to talk about the by-election, which sure. your departure has caused. It'll be June the 1st in the Sioux. Um, it took your party a long time to find a candidate to run. How come? It took our party a long time to win this seat provincially, uh, back to 1937. I was just going so. to ask you that. Do you know you were the first Liberal since 1937 to win that seat? That's right. Provincially. Provincially, right. Yeah. Why did it take so long to find a candidate to run this time? Uh, you know, I, um, I, I'm not going to speculate on... Go ahead. Speculate the, away. ...the reasons. Um, you know, I think, uh, I think there's... Debbie's a very good candidate. She's former mayor. Debbie Amoroso. Debbie Amoroso, uh, former mayor in, in the community. Uh, there are very good candidates running in the mix, two uh, city councillors and a former mayor. So it's a, it is a, a very uh, you know, contested race. Uh, but I, if don't, history I don't know is that any anyone is going to run away with this. I well, think if history is any indication, this seat for, for seven decades basically flipped between the NDP and the Conservatives. And you were the one guy, as we suggested, since right. before World War II to win it for the Liberals. Right. So do we assume that it's going to be either a PC or a New Democrat who wins it this time? You know, I, uh, I can't make a prediction on this. I think it's going to be very close, and I'm not sure who will win. Um, but, um, you know, provincially, uh, I, think, um, I, I think the budget was very good. I mean, I am very impressed with some of the things that were done in the budget with respect to the OHIP uh, investments uh, for drugs, the... Uh, you know, the hydro investment that's going to see rates reduced, the balanced budget. Um, you know, I, here's what I would say. I'm not sure what's going to happen locally, but on a provincial scene, I would not count Kathleen Wynne out. And, well, it's 13 um, months to go before an election. You don't count anybody out 13 well, months to go. No, I, I, think, I think perhaps, you know, some people may have said, you know, it's, it's time for a change. But, I, you know, I think this has been a very good budget, and I think there's... Uh, there's a distance to go yet, and you're, and you're right. I mean, 13 months is, is quite some time tell away. Me, tell me this, though. I mean, you sat at a cabinet table with her. You know her reasonably well. Can you explain to me why she is the most unpopular premier in the history of polling in this province? Uh, you know, um, I think part of, the, uh, part of the challenge with anyone in that position is um, 
you know, how committed they are to the job. And Kathleen Wynne is incredibly committed to doing the uh, best I, I for I don't Ontarians. doubt that, but you're not answering my question. And, and, so, and so in question period, as you know, and on many other issues, Kathleen often, uh, where other premiers in the past may have been a bit more insular uh, and have, you know, steered away from taking on issues head on, uh, you know, Kathleen's decided that she's going to answer that question and she's going to stand up and push back on certain issues that she doesn't agree with and also advocate for the things that she wants to see change. So if there's any problems, so, she, she wears them all then. So she's, she's taken that on and taken a lot of that responsibility and so I think that's where, um, you know, that comes from. And, you know, there are some people inside government who would say that, you know, you want, you want the Premier out making all the positive announcements. You want to keep them away from anything that's negative, allow other ministers to field those questions and, and, and deal with those issues. That all plays out in some of the numbers that you're showing. But, you know, I think it speaks to, um, I, think, I think it speaks to her commitment and her passion as a leader to, to do the best for Ontarians. But, I, you know, I, I don't know where the elections, I don't have a crystal ball any more than anyone else does. But I think, uh, I think the budget was a strong one. And um, if anybody's, thought that, that uh, the Liberals are, uh, you know, written off in some kind of way, I, I, think, uh, I, think we're, I think we're a long way from that. Let's finish up on this then. There, there is still a bit of time before by-election day. And if the Liberals wanted to be more competitive in this by-election, fill in the blank. The Liberal candidate for the Sioux by-election would be able to announce what? Well, as you know, during a by-election, the government is prevented from making any kind of funding announcements in a riding for, you know, reasons of... That doesn't of, stop them uh, from doing it. Well, committing to something in advance, perhaps, is, is uh, you know, maybe a more appropriate way to deal with that. But, um, you know, if I was the candidate... Um, you would want to be at, able to announce this point, what? I, I, would be, I would be talking about the local issues that matter to the community, and I would be talking about the economy. I would be talking about jobs. But would you would like to be able about, to announce what? Well, I'd be talking about lottery jobs, potentially. I'd be talking about, and there's some strong support for SR Steel, which is, which mm -hmm. is uh, you know, going through uh, bankruptcy protection right now. In the province, we announced uh, $30 million uh, some time ago now. But that is there. That continues to be there um, at the ready. I, I think... Uh, other initiatives, whether it's infrastructure, whether it's Trans Canada expansion, whether it's um, uh, you know post-secondary uh, programs um, for either of the institutions, um, jobs, NOHFC expansion of NOH, the NOHFC program, Northern I, Ontario I, I, Heritage, Heritage Fund, Fund, Northern right. Ontario Heritage Fund, uh, which we increased from 60 to 100 million. It's been doing great work, but it could be it could be there could be a bit more in that envelope. Um, so, you know, I'll leave that to Debbie and the campaign team to decide, you know, what it is they, uh, they push as, as their agenda in the community. Uh, but they shouldn't shy away from those things and they should be, they should be aiming high. Who are you uh, voting for in the by-election? Who am I voting for in the by-election? I'm just asking. I, I think it's obvious. Who I'm voting for <laughs> just checking, just checking. <laughs> uh, David, good luck with the new job at Sioux College and uh, we're grateful you could spend some time with us here at TVO tonight. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. It's great to be here with you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.